Hello, and welcome to this interview. I'm Megan Gibson, co-host of the Trauma Super Conference. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Ronald Siegel, an assistant professor of psychology part-time at Harvard Medical School. He's the author of several books, including The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary, Finding Happiness Right Where You Are, and The Mindfulness Solution, Everyday Practices for Everyday Problems. He's a longtime student of mindfulness meditation, teaches internationally about the application of mindfulness practice in psychotherapy and other fields, and maintains a private clinical practice in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Dr. Ronald Siegel, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks so much for inviting me. So one of my favorite things about talking with you is how well you explain the process of evolution and how our brains have evolved to predispose us to things like trauma. So I'd love if you would start there. Yeah, you know, there there are so many aspects of our brains that were adaptive for survival and adaptive for reproducing and passing our genes on to our kids and even for taking care of our kids, which predispose us toward a lot of psychological suffering, including toward trauma. And uh, if, if it's not too complicated of a map, there are actually four, I think, um, predispositions of our brain that get us into trouble vis-a-vis -vis trauma. Uh, the first one is very, very basic. It's, it's something that we share with all other animals. We even share with bacteria. It's the tendency to recoil from that which might be dangerous or painful right? And, uh, and to move toward that which is pleasurable. And we see this obviously throughout the animal kingdom where, um, where all organisms, uh, you know, if, if, if something is, is sharp or hot or in some way painful, they, they will withdraw from it. Um, and uh, the way this shows up for us is, while this makes perfect sense evolutionarily in order to keep our bodies intact and and uh, and and be be healthy in the world when it comes to emotional experience it's not always so wise and what happens is our minds automatically when we have a painful emotional experience recoil from it and withdraw from it. And we do that to such a degree, and we have this interesting capacity to be able to actually block it out of awareness. And you could see also how this would be very adaptive in terms of our, our evolutionary history. Let's say, you know, you had uh, um, experienced something uh, uh, really horrible with a lion, in, you know, in the past out there on the African savanna, and you're in a new situation that requires you to think quickly, you don't want to be thinking about the lion. You want to be thinking about what you have to do now. The same way, for example, a first responder. Now, you know, they're not thinking about all the scary things and the hurt things that have happened. They're focusing on how do I save this person, right? Um, but in the process of pushing it out of awareness, we create a situation in which a lot of our thoughts and feelings are pushed out of awareness, and it's particularly the painful one. So that's that's the first mechanism, and, and and we'll talk about the you know the way in which by splitting off experiences that are painful, we actually predispose us toward all sorts of <clears throat> post traumatic difficulties because these these memories they don't just disappear, as one of my patients put it so eloquently. When we bury feelings, we bury them alive and mm. they come back and they want to re-express themselves. And then we're always stressed out trying to maintain this, trying to keep them out of awareness. So that so that's one mechanism. Another thing that we evolved for is to be able to think, right? Now, you know, again, going back to the African savanna, <clears throat> we weren't very fast, we weren't very tall, we weren't very strong compared to the other animals. If we came face to face with a lion, our recourses were kind of limited. What we're gonna like rid our teeth and show our claws, but that wouldn't work very well, right? Um, so what could we do? Well, we had a few resources. One of them was we were, we were social creatures, so we could cooperate with others, and that's super helpful. We had a prehensile thumb so that we could grab things and uh, make and use tools. That was super helpful. We had this fight or flight system, right, that allowed us to activate ourselves quickly. But the real ace in the hole we had, I mean, the, our, our, our real strength that set us aside from the other animals was this ability to think. But our thinking process is not just some neutral computer. It's subject to what cognitive scientists call the negativity bias. 
or what my friend uh, Rick Hansen uh, uses the metaphor. He says, we're like, um, our brains are like Velcro for bad experiences and Teflon for good ones. Bad experiences happen and they stick. Good ones happen, they slide right off the pan. And uh, there's a good reason for this because when we're out there on the savanna, we could have made one of two types of errors and they actually correspond to type one and type two errors in modern scientific research. A type one error is a false positive, Type two is a false negative. To, to illustrate this, a type one error would be to be looking at a, like a um, beige or yellow shape behind some bushes and think, oh my God, it's a lion, when it's really just a beige rock. And a type two error would be to look at the same thing and say, ah, it's probably just a beige rock when it's really a lion. And you could imagine we could make countless of these type one errors and still live to tell and survive and pass on our DNA to our kids. But one type two error, that's the end of our DNA line. So maybe in ancient times, there were these happy hominids holding hands and telling stories about luscious pieces of fruit and wonderful sexual encounters and, you know, and gorgeous sunny days, but they weren't our ancestors. Why? Because statistically, they died before they got to reproduce. <laughs> Our ancestors were the ones walking around saying, oh, my God, that could be a lion, not another poisonous snake. Oh, one of those plants with the, with the thorns. That was horrible last time. Right. Our ancestors, because it was good for survival, are the ones who have these brains in which bad things stick. So when we've had a traumatic experience, it ha even though there's this tendency to push it out of awareness, it also sticks around because this negativity bias was so helpful for survival. So third thing that we evolved for, we evolved to believe that the world is stable and that things are relatively permanent. Now, why was that useful? Well, you know, if you were wandering around the savannah and you discovered, hey, there's this fruit tree over there at the base of that mountain. Well, remembering that and thinking of that as stable and expecting the fruit tree to be there in the future was going to be helpful because you'd be able to find the, the fruit tree or even just getting the idea that, oh, you know, that person over there is, you know, cooperative and okay. That person over there, watch out for them, right? To, to start... To, we we look for patterns and and pattern recognition involves imagining things will be stable. Well, that's very useful in a lot of situations, but it becomes very problematic when dealing with emotions because when we start to get really sad or really scared or even really angry, we imagine that this is the state forever, right? We we imagine we become afraid of our fear, be afraid of our sadness, afraid of our anger, because we think it's going to stick. We don't, we don't realize the reality, which is, gosh, consciousness is mercurial. It's always changing, right? Different things are happening each moment. And, um, you know, one of my fun exercises, what was your worry three worries ago? <laughs> and, you know, it, it's hard to remember it, but in the moment, it felt like this is going to be it forever, right? And gosh, when I get sad, I get afraid of sadness because like, oh, no, I'm going to always be upset. No, I'm not always going to be upset. But so that dovetails with this tendency to push the painful things out of awareness. We push them out of awareness because we fear that they're going to be permanent. And the fourth thing, the fourth propensity, and it's sort of arbitrary picking four, but these are, I think these are the greatest hits. The fourth one is um, our preoccupation with ourselves and with what other people think about us. Um, uh, you know, out there on the African savanna, there was a lot of concern with being dominant, right? And, you know, you see this pattern where there's often a dominant male surrounded by literally a harem of reproductively promising females. And then over in the next field, uh, there would be a group of uh, often a little bit younger males doing the species specific equivalent of playing basketball, you know, trying to develop the skills to become dominant. Now, why does dominance matter so much? Well, the dominant ones and the, uh, the dominant males and the females that had kids with dominant males, they had better luck at passing on their DNA because they had access to more resources and were able to protect the kids and, and, and like that. So there's a lot of concern for this. And that all sounds very primitive. And yes, we see it play out in human affairs in which world leaders historically 
male w- world leaders have had literal harems and that kind of thing. And we see people with their trophy wives. There, I mean, there there are current versions Examples. of this. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the way this plays out much more broadly for all of us, um, and isn't just a guy thing, is fluctuating self-esteem. We are very concerned with how we're doing. How do I feel about myself? Uh, you know, right now, um, am I doing a good job presenting these ideas? You know, is is Megan smiling and thinking? Uh, no pressure, you know. But thinking, always, I'm always smiling and thinking. <laughs> which is lovely. About you. Which is actually lovely and very encouraging. But but the, but the you know the the sort of looking for feedback. Am I doing okay? Or just you know going through the world? Should I have said that? Oh, do I look okay? Um, am I being a nice person? Am I a good enough friend? I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ways in which we're always evaluating ourselves and judging ourselves and thinking we're either good or bad and um so this kind of self-esteem preoccupation and preoccupation with self-judgment plays a huge role in our suffering and the way it relates to trauma is almost everybody who's been through trauma feels some shame around it either they feel shame around um the you know the post-traumatic symptoms like i don't know you know i freeze in these situations i go blank i don't feel like i'm able to connect to people uh you know i feel dead inside uh, just naming some of the possibilities right um so people feel ashamed about having post-traumatic symptoms or often people are ashamed of having been through the trauma that you know certainly people who have been uh you know sexually mistreated and the traumas in that area almost always feel like something's wrong with them because this happened people who are suffering from what we now call moral injury like the you know the the people in combat who under the circumstances do something and and in retrospect it's like oh my god you know an innocent person was was killed or injured and you know, they feel terrible about themselves so that this self-judgment including harsh self-judgment gets much much worse when people have been um uh through trauma and yet the self-judgment is part of this whole self-esteem regulation which really comes from comparing ourselves to others and thinking am i okay am i good enough and um uh, in fact in in the intro you you mentioned one of my uh, books which is very recent which is the extraordinary gift of being ordinary which is really about gosh can we do anything about that can we do anything about this constant self evaluation and self judgment and can we land in a place where instead we feel connected to one another and safe but it's not all about being good or bad better or worse and 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 all of that stuff so so those are those are four these are very natural things. Um, I, I guess I'll throw in a fifth. I mentioned it in I love passing. It. Bonus, bonus content. Let's bonus go. content. I mentioned it in passing. This fight or flight response, right? That we evolved for the body to get aroused. It's you know, we, we the sympathetic nervous system arousal um, where the heart races and our respiration picks up, and we're getting ready to fight or flee, right? To to respond to some kind of danger. Super important for survival. Yet when we've been traumatized, this fight or flight response is constantly getting rekindled, reactivated by the memories of the bad thing that happened that's been pushed out of awareness or that we're trying to keep out of awareness. So that's the fifth one. That uh, So I'm sorry, we didn't evolve to be happy and we didn't evolve actually to handle bad things happening very well. Um, we evolved for survival and passing on our DNA. And that's why, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we we have to kind of work on it when we've been traumatized. So uh, long exposition, but uh, um, I think uh, hopefully a useful, a useful context. Extremely useful context. Um, and as you were talking about the last one, I was like, we evolved not to be happy. I love it when you say that. Like, I just have to repeat it. We didn't evolve to be happy. Um, because to me, it feels so validating. I mean, so many people, I think more people than ever, are just struggling with the fact that they're not happy all the time and, yeah. and judging themselves for it. And after the last three years, especially globally, you know, the things that we've kind of been through and experienced together, it's no wonder, you know, some of us are struggling to be happier than others. Um, and yeah, I just the, had this, the visual of like all that dirty Velcro, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> And the self-judgment around around the happiness, it's so interesting how that's reinforced by our cultures um, that uh, 
this is not going to be a polemic for um, against free market societies because the alternatives have their problems too. But but one of the psychological side effects of a free market economy is we're always selling stuff to one another. And the way we sell it is by saying, <clears throat> buy this and you'll be happy, right? So you're looking at the Pepsi commercial and they're the people, you know, looking beautiful, playing volleyball out on the beach, being really happy, drinking Pepsi. And when I don't feel this inside, it's like, oh, it's my mistake. I bought Coke, right? I mean, that, that's actually the implicit message here. But we, we absorb this and we see all these messages of other people who seem to be doing great. And oh my God, social media, you know. I was going to say, we used to only get it from advertising. Now we get it from social media. Yeah, yeah. you know, curated feeds, uh, you know, on Instagram and TikTok and, and, and Facebook. And, you know, not that many people post and they say, woke up this morning, had the runs again because I'm really anxious. I'm afraid my boss is going to give me a bad review and, you know, my girlfriend or boyfriend's going to leave me. It's like, no, here I am doing fantastic things at this fantastic party, having fantastic times and you're not with, you're not invited, you know? And so, oh my gosh, you know, the opportunities for self-judgment and about not about the fact that life is difficult and thinking that it's just because I'm a failure that I'm having difficulty rather than, no, this is universally human and we're all in this together. Yeah. And I want to touch on that a little bit more in a second, but I also wanted to go back to something you said before uh, in these five things that you listed. And I was, if anybody sees me looking down in a, in a cutaway, it's because I'm taking notes. I'm not texting or checking Instagram, um, but I, I always take notes when Ron talks. Um, but that some of these things also evolved, kind of the the things that we judge as being um, like the preoccupation with ourselves that we judge as being not um, superfluous, if you will, it was actually until like 50 years ago, especially if you were a woman, like necessary to survival, Absolutely. social acceptance and having other people judge you as part of the group. I mean, until very recent history was a necessity of survival, right? Absolutely. And even things that we think of as, you know, ridiculously superficial, like, um, you know, being physically attractive. Well, you know, that, you know, that had to do, there was a correlation between that and whether your, your genes can get passed down, you know, Absolutely. and, 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 and none of this is, by the way, it's really important. I think when we talk about evolutionary psychology and the, the ways in which the brain evolved, this is not advocating that we act in accordance to right, the right. predispositions, right? Um, because the brain also evolved, for example, uh, to be very attracted to fat and sugar. You know, almost every culture has its equivalent of donuts, right? Um, uh, because way back on the savanna, calories were the name of the game, and you and fat and sugar meant you know you were going to have calories, and you could you know you could have energy to power the next day. Nowadays, if we basically focus on donuts as our main nutrient, it doesn't work out so well. So in the same way that being very concerned with what other people think about me and how am I doing and how I compare to others, yes, that once had important evolutionary value and it's a, it's natural that our brains do that. It's not like we want to double down on that. We may want to, you know, find more sustainable pathways to well-being and be really compassionate with ourselves when we find ourselves getting hooked um, on these things. I was, um, uh, my daughter happens to be a dermatologist. And uh, so the interface between dermatology and psychology is something that we talk about some. Okay. And, you know, it's so interesting. It's like, you know, when does it, when does it make sense to try to you know, I mean, if somebody's like badly disfigured from some dermatological disorder, I think everybody would get on board with, you want to try to fix that if you can, you know, because gosh, you know, people are going to react to you and all this, you know, if it's like a few wrinkles, you know, should you be working with it psychologically rather than working with it dermatologically? So there, there's a sort of tension there. But, and she was pointing out in the conversation, she said, you also have a man's perspective, right? that and and we could put this in the evolutionary context right that evolutionarily yeah there was more pressure on females around this stuff um uh in 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 many ways so it, it's it, so it's all complicated 
Yeah, absolutely. And and still is. I mean, I, I used to be um, a television news journalist and you got to believe there was a, a giant double standard. It was funny. I, I mean, a man could wear the same exact suit on set every single day and no one would notice. Right. <laughs> but if a woman came in a ponytail one day to work on set, everybody was writing to the station. How dare she wear, right? I mean, there's definitely a, a, a and success and capitalism and the the world that we live in it all plays in but yeah it, um, and, and it tends to reinforce these things that are that that we already have predispositions toward which 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 unfortunately amplifies our suffering yeah and i think what you're saying really is that it's not that our um evolutionary leanings excuse us not becoming self-aware of these right. tendencies that were built for our protection and survival um it doesn't absolve us of responsibility right like yeah we, we well can... and 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 the more aware of it we can be i think the more we have a chance to make conscious decisions right the same way the more aware uh, okay I, you know to make a conscious decision about that donut also to make a conscious decision of you know do i want to be you know climbing the ladder you know stepping on my friends along the way or do i want to you know ease up on this or you know do i want to when i'm with my friend be showing off my accomplishments or do i want to be sharing my vulnerabilities and finding a way to connect we don't we don't have to go with these these instincts and being aware of them is actually more helpful for choosing Absolutely. So speaking of awareness, let's kind of shift into this area of expertise of yours also around mindfulness and compassion practices and how they are antidotes to these developmental tendencies resulting from evolution. So uh, we can actually go through um, all five of them uh, uh, right. this way. So um, so the first one is, you know, it, it show, this tendency to avoid pain shows up in emotional or experiential avoidance um the uh and we, we you know we see it all over uh you know it's it's everything from you know wanting to have a drink after coming home after a day of work and you know feeling like this and wanting to relax right but we want to avoid this and change it into something more pleasant and you know done in moderation you know no harm no foul but if you're compulsively need to use substances to regulate your system well that that can become problematic as, as we know or you know when it comes to things like anxiety um uh you know if i got nervous before public speaking or flying in airplanes but did that anyway I don't have an anxiety disorder. I'm just kind of a nervous guy. I actually am kind of a nervous guy, so I know what that's like. Um, but if, but if um, uh, but if I avoid doing those things in order to avoid feeling the pain of anxiety, well, then then I have a problem. So this this tendency to avoid things is problematic. And what's happening in trauma, of course, is that the the brain, the mind is automatically avoiding things. It's actually blocking things out of awareness. So we don't even sometimes remember the memory, or if we do, we we have a way of of, of tensing up to turn away from it all the time. Well, one of the first things we're doing in mindfulness practices is you know, a, a brief definition is mindfulness is being aware of present experience with loving acceptance. And that means that we're not, we're not turning away. We're, we're deliberately practicing being with and opening to. So when an image comes, when we're doing some, let's say we're doing mindfulness practice as some form of meditation to develop mindfulness, you know, when the upsetting image comes to mind, instead of turning on the radio, going to the fridge, looking at our phone, we actually sit there, breathe, and let the image come and go. So instead of experiential avoidance, which again is this very basic tendency to just get rid of pain, we learn to have experiential approach, to turn toward that which is perhaps uncomfortable at the moment, and to trust that it, by turning toward it and opening toward it, it will transform by itself, or we will become sufficiently um, capable, capable and conversant with it, right? Mm -hmm. That 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 we're okay. Um, and and sometimes it's something like you know a wave of sadness or a wave of fear or a wave of anger that comes up. Instead of how do I get this to go away? How do I distract myself? How do I undo it? We turn toward it. So that's that's the first antidote, the first way in which mindfulness practices work. So the second issue, this negativity bias, 
in our in our thinking right that we tend to think the worst and imagine the worst and remember the worst um well one of the things we're doing in mindfulness practice is is we always start with a sensory object you know whether it's paying attention to the breath or sounds or visual or the visual field or if we're doing walking meditation we pay attention to the sensations of the feet uh touching the ground and leaving the ground and of course thoughts arise as they naturally do because that was that was so useful for our survival our, our brains secrete thought all the time right um but instead of following each narrative stream as we normally would we sort of gently and lovingly bring the attention back to the sensory object and by doing that over and over we actually start to see thoughts as thoughts uh psychologists call this metacognitive awareness the awareness that a thought is a thought rather than a reality because most of the time when we're walking around during the day you know if i have a thought of oh god you know uh uh, you know, let's say it's a negative thought, mm, you know, I'm really a failure, I haven't ac accomplished much in life, or eh, people don't really like me very much, or let, let's say it's a negative thought. When a thought like that happens, it's not like, oh, there's a negative thought arising, it's like reality, right? And and we sink along with that reality. As we practice mindfulness, we start noticing, oh, there's a negative thought arising. And this helps a lot with the self-judgment stuff because it, it's the positive one too, you know, hey, uh, you know, I'm the greatest psychologist since sliced bread. Oh yeah, there's your inflated thought again. <laughs> you know, we, we, we start to see all of these things as, as coming and going and not identify with them and believe in them so much. Uh, I love so that you the, gave both the positive and the negative because they can yeah. both be very trapping, right? Oh, it's, totally, yeah. totally. We get totally trapped in 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 why not have these positive fantasies or positive evaluations. Um, so the third one um is this um uh you know, this tendency to think of things as permanent. They uh, um philosophers call this reification, making solid that which is fluid. And uh you know, there is nothing like mindfulness practice to show you that everything's fluid. Because what happens is when we're when we're sitting and letting thoughts come and go, and we're being with some sensory object of awareness, we notice, oh my gosh, consciousness is a river. It's this constant flow of experience. That that thought of three seconds ago, gone, gone over the waterfall. You know, it's as though there's a river going, it's all going over a waterfall. You know, again, you know, three worries ago, gone. We can hardly even get it, even though at the time it was super important. And, you know, sadness comes and goes, joy comes and goes, feelings of love come and go, feelings of fear come, it's all fluid. So we start to actually see that and, and we get more of a sense of, and then we start to notice, oh my gosh, all things in the world are impermanent. It's not just the flow of consciousness, but buildings come and go, people come and go, civilizations come and go. I hate to say this, democracies come and go. Um, you, we, I, I don't want to make this You're too, too existentialist but, about it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it, because it, but it, but it is profound. But it does go there, doesn't it? Yeah, it's profound, and it helps to free us in in a more narrow psychological way. Um, as well. And and then mindfulness can really help us with the self-evaluation stuff. We can really start to use it both to watch the self-esteem roller coaster, to watch, you know, how in the course of an hour, you know, we can go from feeling good about ourselves to feeling bad about ourselves to feeling good about ourselves again. Um, so we 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 get to see the roller coaster and uh and it helps us to also and this this one's a little bit of a reach but when we practice enough we actually notice the interconnectedness of things we actually get it that oh you know i'm part of a larger ecosystem and i wouldn't eat i wouldn't have electricity i wouldn't be able to survive if it weren't for all these other people you know who are doing all these things doing their part in in the society and it really does take a village to do anything you know we're not these separated um independent organisms we are very interdependent and in fact we're interdependent with all of life and 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 everything on the planet and the planet's interdependent with other planets we we start to get this sense of connectedness that comes from this and that is an enormously powerful antidote 
to the preoccupation with how I'm doing. Um, and all these things kind of, um, they reinforce one another and they fit in with one another. Like when we get it that everything's impermanent, including the fact that we're not gonna live forever. Well, that's interesting. So all these things I'm worried about, like what does everybody think about me? How successful am I at work? All this stuff It's like, yeah, it's important, but mm, is it really, you know, there's a, um, uh, great little exercise uh, if, if I may put you slightly on the spot. Do you know who the King of England was in, in uh, 1342? Was that George? It may have been. I'm not George. exactly sure. It, it may have been. I'm not exactly sure myself. But in 1342, whenever I said, everybody in England knew and he was a really <laughs> big deal. <laughs> yep. right? So, you know, even if you're like the king, it's like, hmm. <laughs> This I can be king forever, are you? This isn't going to last either. So, you know, so we, we start to get this kind of perspective, which helps to helps us to relax around all the, the, the self-esteem stuff. So actually mindfulness practices are super helpful for all of this. And the compassion practices, which, which go hand in hand with mindfulness practices, are really, really helpful both for holding ourselves and hugging ourselves because it is painful to be a human being. And all of these propensities of the brain, not only did we not evolve to be happy, we actually evolved to feel a lot of pain, right? These, thing, these things hurt, every one of them hurts, right? And, and when we're hurting, there's nothing like a hug, right? To be helpful. It doesn't make the thing all go away, but it transforms the experience when we feel held. So we, so both having compassion for others so that we can connect safely to others and can, you know, hold hands through this difficult life and having compassion for ourselves so that instead of the harsh critical judgment, we're able to be loving toward ourselves with the difficulty loving toward ourselves as we let ourselves approach the traumatic memories. Um, uh, you know, so the, so compassion and mindfulness work hand in hand as antidotes to these propensities. And I'd, I'd love if you could talk for just a second about, you know, we talked about kind of that looking away tendency, avoidance of pain, avoidance of discomfort, um, but some of those dissociative traits in the way that we compartmentalize daily life are useful for us <laughs> through life, right? Like none of us are toddlers usually walking around during the day. We can't all just feel our stop and feel our feelings totally. <laughs> in every minute of every day situationally, like, you know, um, so the, the, the sweet spot between yeah. being, you know, a functioning adult in society and also not completely turning away from everything that's difficult. Super, super important question. Um, you know, I was once uh, giving a talk to surgeons at uh, Children's Hospital here in Boston. It's a, it's a major hospital. They, they get difficult cases and they get cases where kids die, right? Um, and uh, and I, was, I was basically talking about, you know, using mindfulness and compassion practices to be able to be present with patients, you know, who are really suffering because it, it helps us to, to show up as, as clinicians and to be able to process the feelings that happen when things go wrong, when we see, you know, I mean, you know, talk about painful experiences, you know, kids suffering and kids who die, oh God, you know, how do you process all that and not just basically block it out, develop PTSD and drink a lot, right? And, right. and so I was talking to surgeons about this. And afterwards, the chief of surgery came up to me and he says, you know, we spend years teaching our, resi our surgical residents how to not feel. Because when there's a kid in the emergency room and something's happening in their heart, I want the cardiac surgeon to be thinking about hydraulics, think about mechanics, thinking about, you know, metabolism and, you know, thinking about um, physiology, not thinking about the mother who's saying, don't let my baby die. And absolutely, it was speaking to your point, there are many, many moments in life, and not just if you're a trauma surgeon, but many moments where we really want to be using our executive functioning. We really want to be thinking what's needed here, what's the effective action, what's on my to-do list, all of that. I think the art is also allowing time when we're not under threat, when there isn't some goal that we have to accomplish right now to process 
how difficult life has been. And the problem is so many of us push these things away for executive functioning in order to to do things in the world and to be effective and you know good at our roles whether that's being you know um, a parent or a, or a teacher or a cardiac surgeon um we push these things away and then they're buried alive and then they're always threatening to come back and um come back into a con consciousness which is interesting the reason why when we split things off with trauma they don't just stay split off is because you know the heart and mind have a natural healing propensity uh interestingly there's uh you know probably people are aware because it's gotten a lot of popular press there's a lot of work being done in uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy right now and it it has many many parallels with uh mindfulness assisted psychotherapy they, it, where it, it's it's doing the same kind of work um at a somewhat different pace in a, in a somewhat different structure and um one of the leaders in that field is a is a um uh, a physician named uh, Michael Mithoffer, who had been a um, an emergency room doc, and he says, you know, when people come into the emergency room and let's say they have a broken arm, I can't heal the arm. I can't knit the bones back together. I can set the arm and cast it and create the conditions by which the body will naturally heal itself. That's what I can do. Well, that's what's happening in the psychological realm also mindfulness practices compassion practices help to create these conditions and then it's this natural healing propensity of the heart and the mind that takes over and this natural healing propensity interestingly is the propensity to reintegrate everything that's been pushed out the reason we have nightmares the reason we have flashbacks is because the mind wants to heal itself i i, I know this sounds um uh, a little anthropomorphizing as though the mind is thinking but the brain evolved to heal itself in the same way that the that the bones of the arm evolved to heal themselves and and what healing looks like here is integration is allowing these things back in to awareness but the pacing becomes so critical and there are times during the day when no this isn't the time even to process the difficulty of the moment um notwithstanding the historical difficulty that this is reminding me of so you know i'm feeling rejected here you know my heart's sinking um i'm feeling frightened you know oh but i got to do something so I, you know i'm going to do this thing so it's not the moment to process the emotions of the moment nor the fact that oh gosh this is resonating with the times i got rejected as a kid and the times that you know that i felt excluded and not good enough for whatever reason you know as a kid so but if it's at all possible we also need to carve out and create time in which we can allow this healing to happen and mindfulness and compassion practices are one structure um uh that we can use uh to facilitate it because we're providing kind of antidotes to these predispositions where you know we're not going to get so caught in the thoughts we're going to approach and allow the feelings to um to arise and i didn't touch on the fifth one you know when we're the fifth one meaning the fifth propensity of the the mind here that gets us into trouble mindfulness practices over time do tend to diminish this fight or flight response because instead of reacting like i've got to do something about it by turning our attention toward whatever the threat is of the moment, whether it be a thought or a feeling or whatnot, um, we're not always in this threat response system because we we get into fight or flight when the organism feels threatened. And instead, we're in a kind of open receptive posture where even though the contents may be at times painful, we're not resisting them so much. So so it also helps with the, with the fight or flight system. Um, I hope I'm not packing too much into uh, a brief oh, period of time but it's it, th these things all fit together as part of a picture yeah and i'm glad you brought the last part up because i was my next question was just gonna be i'm so glad that you knitted kind of psychedelic assisted therapy with mindfulness practices because what was occurring to me was that both are taking that fight or flight response part of the brain the amygdala offline and making it safe like right creating safety for the physiology that's out of your control there's, there's not much you can do about the fact that you've been activated by something um your palms are sweating or your heart is racing or you can't get a deep breath or all the other things i don't want to activate people while they're watching but that you can physiologically feel that isn't in your conscious control you can't tell your heart 
I would like you to stop beating so fast right now. Right, I've tried, right? right. I yeah, no, it. no. And, right. and the, the whole, <clears throat> when the, you know, one of the discoveries with mindfulness practice is, oh my God, I can't control my mind at all, right? <laughs> that, you know, the, 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 the sort of the first thing people discover is, you know, it's wild. It's it, it has a mind of its own, so to speak, um, and uh, very humbling. You know, uh, initially when we take up uh, these practices, but it's uh, also very useful. And then, ironically, when we stop trying to control it in that way, indeed, the amygdala quiets down. You know, we're, we it because the trying to control it is one of the factors that keeps us so so aroused so often. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to talk about kind of the considerations that you take when teaching people mindfulness and compassion practices when you know that there's a trauma history. Yeah, S super important. Uh, broadly speaking, <clears throat> mindfulness and compassion practices do two things at the same time. One is they actually increase our capacity to be with discomfort. Um, it happens in part when you're simply sitting and meditating and physical discomfort comes up, one of the instructions that's usually given is instead of immediately scratching the itch or changing your posture to, to take care of the ache, what if you were to gently just turn your attention to the discomfort and use it as the sensory object of your awareness? So instead of following the breath or listening to sounds, you actually pay attention to the itch or the ache as your focus. And what people often discover is Oh, it transforms. It doesn't stay permanently. It, it's impermanent too, and it changes. And that becomes a really useful tool because we start to notice, oh, when sadness arises or, or fear or anger, or when these difficult emotions arises in the body, oh, I can turn my attention to that. I can be with that. And doing that increases our capacity to be with it. The other thing that, the, that these practices do is because we're not distracting ourselves you know, with our phone every every couple of minutes, we're, we're really just being with whatever's happening inside, it softens the repression barrier. It softens our, um, our tendency to block painful things out of awareness. So more painful things come into awareness. We're, we, we face our demons here, they, they arise. Um, the challenge is mindfulness and compassion practice don't necessarily do these two things at the same pace. So sometimes we start doing these practices and the demons start showing up before we've like developed sufficient strength to be able to be okay with the demons. And then we feel overwhelmed. And um, uh, you, if, if you don't mind my mentioning, you had said, pre we were talking you know, just before the interview and you said, gosh, you know, when I start tried starting to meditate didn't go so well right it, it, yeah you can uh, help me I, I hated meditation and i hated everybody that told me i should meditate for yeah, a good 15 yeah, exactly. years yeah yeah and and my guess would be that's because you know bits and pieces of the demons were showing up creating an agitated state before there was the capacity to be able to be with those yeah, bits and pieces absolutely of the what i always tell people is that um it's like if you've ever tried to clean out the ignored section of your home, whether that's a garage or a closet or a basement or an attic or something, and you're like, you put your mind to it and you're like, I, I, first I got to take everything out. And so you just make the mess way bigger, right? Yeah. And now everything's everywhere, whereas it used to be packed away somewhere where you didn't have to deal with it. Now everything's everywhere. Now you've actually got to like organize, compartmentalize, decide what stays, what goes, how does it go back? Like that's the analogy I always use. That's a great um, analogy. And so, yeah, that that sense of overwhelm that you named is something you have to deal with, right? Yeah, and and interestingly, you know, this is one of the things that happens with the with the psychedelic assisted psychotherapies that they open people up very very rapidly. And part of the you know at the moment they're mostly being done above where where it's being done. There's a whole underground, but people doing this above board with with trained clinicians and the like. Um, it's mostly in research studies, and what happens is after a certain number of follow-up sessions, the research study ends, but exactly as you said, all these things are spread out and that's not so good, right? That can be too much. And the exact same thing can happen with mindfulness practice where, where all this stuff comes up and it's like, what do I do with it? Um, and it, it's not that it's a bad idea, right, to be doing this, but pacing becomes very important. Well, interestingly, some mindfulness practices are more likely to build this capacity to be with the discomfort, while others are going to do a little bit more of the uncovering. And it's not a, a, a 
it doesn't always work 100% this way. But in general, you know, uh, I mean, if you were to, if, if I can invite our listeners to, if uh, viewers, if you're not, you know, listening while driving or something, you know, to close your eyes and just generate just a little bit of sadness, not the saddest thing ever, but just a little bit in the body and put your hand over the part of your body where you feel that for a moment and just breathe with that for a moment. And then a little bit of fear or anxiety, again, not the scariest thing, but just a little bit. Put your hand over that and breathe with that. And okay, we can we can just do those two and just, uh, uh, open. Let's open our eyes again. And um, I'm going to guess because I've done this with groups that very few people said, "Yeah, I mostly experience sadness in in my left elbow, or fear in the big toe of my right foot." Right? It's it's all somewhere in here, right? That we tend to experience emotions. So when we do a mindfulness practice, like what many people think of as the standard mindfulness practice of, "Oh, let's follow the sensations of the breath." Well, the breath is here, right? So if we're sensitizing ourselves to this part of the body, we're gonna we're gonna bump into our sadness and our fear. Where that's where it lives, and it's probably gonna open the door to all sorts of memories. And 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 that and we may not be ready for that right now. And we really it's it's really important to respect that we may not be ready for that right now. So instead. We might decide, let's do walking meditation in nature. Let's go to a park or the woods if you live in a more rural area and go for a walk and just start paying attention to the sensation of the feet, touching the ground and lifting the ground. And once the mind settles a little bit, once you have a little bit of concentration on that, then expand it out to include the trees and the, uh, uh, you know, and the clouds and things. And let thoughts come and go, but keep bringing your attention back to the sensory reality of just walking in nature. This sadness may come up, fear may come up. I'm not saying it's, it's it, you know, there's, it's absolute this way, but you're likely to feel a little bit more like I'm in a safe place. The universe is a safe place. The present moment is a safe place. I can take refuge in the present moment and I can permit these things to come and go in a way in which if we're just inside, uh, it's more likely it's gonna, it may feel like too much. So that's that's a, an example of, of the kinds of, you know, adjustments uh, that we might wanna make. In, in my book, The Mindfulness Solution that you also mentioned, it, it really goes through a lot of different mindfulness practices and how you would adjust them and how you might choose them. It's always an experiment. Yeah, everybody's different, but at least what we've seen from uh, from other people's experience, uh, you know, how, how we might get into doing mindfulness practice in a way that feels safe um, if we have uh, a lot of unresolved trauma. Yeah, absolutely. And the just in case it helps anybody else listening, what I was thinking while you were describing the two different types is that it's it's almost like, you know, if you've got some activation, if you've got some trauma history, traditional, like you're just going to sit and you're going to count your breaths um, and allow thoughts to pass feels like you're confronting yourself, like you're you're facing one another, but you're it's yourself you're facing. Whereas, you know, I go out and in nature, I take a walk, I'm walking alongside myself mm. yeah very um, nice yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's just how it felt for me so in case that helps mm -hmm. anyone else i mean I'm, I'm a person that walks a lot and mm -hmm. uh and has integrated that into my mindfulness practices so i appreciate that as well and i love anyone who can tell me that there's more than one way to yeah. arrive well, and it's, and it's also yeah absolutely it's it's also really important to realize that you know there's a lot of times where where the the intensity of emotions that we're going through is is so high that it's going to be really hard to, hard to do a certain kind of practice that you know to uh, this sometimes surprises people when I um, uh, out myself around this but if I'm in like a really bad emotional state like, I don't know something's happened and yeah yeah I've had a an argument with somebody I care about or what or 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 some mess at work or something um, you know the big guns for me are 
first go and do aerobic exercise for like maybe half an hour or more to, you know, just release some of the growth, stress. then do some kind of yoga or stretching or something like that, where I'm letting it go. And, you know, and then I can do some nice walking meditation. And maybe after that, I could actually do sitting meditation, and be with the breath. Right. But it's a sequence because I'm not ready to just sit there still. I mean, I, I maybe I could force myself, but it, it it would be hard going, and and it makes a lot more sense to find pathways toward well being that are gradual and that are easier, and and where what we do fits the the uh, the state that we're in at the moment. And it makes so much sense, right? Because physiologically, chemically all of the the things that happen when you get activated are meant to be used and released. And if you, you know, have a confrontation with someone, if you have an argument with someone that you love, or you have a situation at work that's difficult to deal with, and you've got all the physiological activity going on that would be associated with a threat, and then try to like sit and breathe your way through it, or just reason your way through it in your mind, it doesn't make any sense. You've still got all the, all this useless stuff. (laughs) Yeah, it's not useless, right. but you know what I mean. Useless yeah. for what you're trying to do. Yeah, you've got to go get rid of it. You gotta, you gotta move it out. Yeah, we have to respect <clears throat> respect our animal nature, really. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, Ron Siegel, how can people find out more about you and your work and your books? Um, well, I have a website which is drronsiegel.com, and that's a portal to all sorts of free meditation practices that you're welcome to um, <clears throat> stream and listen to and, and use or um, or download. Um, plus uh, information about the various books is all um, is, is all up there as well. And again, the Mindfulness Solution book is more kind of step-by-step instructions in uh, developing a mindfulness practice and adapting it to different circumstances. And the other book that um, I've been involved in, a bunch of professional books too, but the other um, book for uh, <clears throat> for uh, general audiences is uh, The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary, which is, which is really the fruit of me realizing that there I was already in my 60s, you know, having been a meditator for decades uh, and a psychologist for decades. And you'd think that out of this, I would have developed something called the coherent, secure, stable sense of self, but nope. My feelings about myself are fluctuating, you know, sometimes by the minute, sometimes by the hour, sometimes by the day or the week, but basically with, you know, good fortune or bad fortune, either feeling like, hey, you know, I'm I'm pretty good, you know, and other times feeling, oh, you know, I'm a terrible husband or bad dad or, or, or not so great as a psychologist or whatever it might be, uh, and realizing, gosh, this is, maybe it's not just me, maybe this is a little bit more universal than that. And um, how can we how can we find more reliable pathways toward well being? So that book is is really about that. I love that. Thank you so much, Ron. I'm going to check that book out. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being with us today.